For those online, we're just going to get started in a couple of minutes. All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to this year's special town meeting forum. Uh, we've done this the last couple of years, um, have a community meeting to bring folks together um, before town meeting to go through the warrant. Uh, if you have any questions, concerns, want clarification or clarity on any of the articles to be discussed and debated um, at annual or special town meeting. Um, so on your way in, you grabbed a town meeting booklet. Uh, so this is the booklet that uh, voters will all receive coming into town meeting on Monday. Um, so at the onset of the booklet, um, you'll see um, a Q&A, uh, overview of the articles, a letter from the finance committee. And then in the booklet uh, this year, we also included sort of a town meeting 101, a glossary of terms, uh, motions. We've had a lot of new people attend town meetings recently, and so we wanna make sure folks go into the meeting understanding the procedural rules, um, how to make a motion, what call the question means, uh, things like that. We also have uh, folks online, so this is a hybrid meeting. Appreciate everybody in the room and appreciate everyone um, that's there online. Uh, when it comes time for questions, you can uh, go up to the mic uh, or we can pass around the mic. And then we'll also be taking questions from those folks that are online. Um, I'm Alex Morris, the town manager. Uh, we're joined by Dan Ravello, assistant town manager. Uh, Braden Witt, our uh, senior project manager at the DPW. Um, Tyler from IT, because whenever there's computers involved, we need someone from IT. Um, Leslie, our board of health director. And Tim Famulari, our community development director. Um, and so appreciate them all being here as well. So this evening we'll go through um, the warrant article by article. Um, we have uh, slides that accompany uh, the warrant as well. Um, as I mentioned, what you're seeing on the screen now is just basic town meeting procedures. That's also in your booklet. Um, so how to introduce an article, how to amend a motion, how to consider something out of its scheduled order, uh, so on and so forth. And this booklet is a PDF online on our website and so folks are um, able to go to the website, read through the booklet, uh, and prepare for Monday's uh, Monday's meeting. 
we have 14 articles uh, today, so a special town meeting. Um, so in the province town charter, uh, the first Monday of every April is our annual town meeting. So that happens on an annual basis. Special town meetings aren't always a, a certain thing. So a year ago, we had a special town meeting specifically to address the sewer expansion plan uh, that passed uh, through town meeting. Uh, this year, uh, one article in particular was the impetus to schedule a special town meeting. And we'll get to that. That's Article 8, the purchase and acquisition of two parcels on Nelson Ave. Uh, so the select board called the special town meeting, uh, given that the closing of those properties would happen before the end of the calendar year, and we were not able to wait until April. Uh, and given that we scheduled a special town meeting on October 23rd, uh, we thought it was a great opportunity to address other issues that the town town staff, town boards, and residents have been working on over the last several months. Because there's only 14 articles uh, compared to the dozens of articles we typically see at an annual town meeting. Article one um, is a relatively standard article. We see this uh, typically at annual town meeting. Uh, we have a number of prior year bills. Um, and so to pay bills in the new fiscal year that are bills from the previous fiscal year, a town meeting needs to vote to approve that uh, transfer. Uh, it totals just under $11,000. So that'll be the first article uh, on Monday night. Article two uh, establishes a Provincetown Municipal Airport Enterprise Fund. Uh, this article would establish a more structured budget for the airport by creating an airport enterprise fund that would be subject to approval at annual town meeting, similar to the water and sewer enterprise fund. Uh, right now we have a special revenue account for the airport. Uh, we have a small amount of money each year in the regular budget, around 80,000 that goes to the airport. Uh, most of the budget and infrastructure is supported by grants from the Federal Aviation Administration and the Mass Department of Transportation. Uh, the town is in the middle of negotiating uh, a new lease with the National Park Service uh, for the airport to be on parkland. It's one of only two airports in the country that is on parkland. It's Provincetown in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Uh, Jackson Hole succeeded in negotiating a multi-decade lease uh, with the national government, and we're in the process of doing that as well. Um, and second, we're renegotiating our lease with Cape Air, uh, which is our main tenant at the, at the airport. Uh, and so town council um, advised that the town replicate other municipal airports, create an enterprise fund that makes the budget more transparent and the expenditures and revenues uh, would be subject to town meeting approval at future annual town meetings. And so assuming this passes on Monday night, we'll come before town meeting in April uh, for the first time for a municipal airport enterprise fund budget uh, to be voted on by the body. Article three, a uh, similar establishing of a fund. <clears throat> this would establish a receipt for serve for appropriation ambulance fund. Um, many folks are likely aware that Lower Cape Ambulance Association um, ceased to exist as of August 31st. Uh, both Truro and Provincetown have now um, tra transitioned um, EMS to it being a town uh, run system. And so the Provincetown Fire Department over the last several months, uh, we've onboarded and hired 14 full-time paramedics and EMTs um, that are keeping up with the call volume. Uh, when Lower Cape handled the contract for Provincetown and Truro, they billed and received 100% of the ambulance billing revenue, uh, be it from private insurance, Medicaid, Mass Health. Now that the town is uh, doing EMS itself, the town will now be able to bill um, and get the revenue. And so in order to accept the revenue, um, we need to establish the ambulance fund, something that we haven't had to do in 76 years. Um, on an annual basis, Lower Cape over the last three years is bringing in roughly $800,000 in ambulance billing receipts. Um, the town contracted with the very same uh, billing provider, Coastal Medical Billing, that Lower Cape um, had for many years. And so it's been a pretty seamless transition. Uh, and again, this is a more of a bureaucratic step in order to allow the town to accept um, the ambulance bills. Article four um, is coming from the Capital Stabilization Fund. Uh, so this is an article you would typically see at annual town meeting in the CIP. Um, given the timeliness and wanting to advance the design and construction documents for this project, uh, we didn't wanna wait until April to get a final design and a better estimate of the uh, implementation plan for the modern field. 
master planning process. And so this article would appropriate 250,000 to cover the next phase of design and development costs for the MATA field, including the creation of construction documents. And so our plan uh, over the next several months would be to work with um, our consulting firm, design firm, and come back to annual town meeting in April with a more specific number for the actual implementation and construction of the MATA field uh, master plan. Uh, many folks here in the community engaged in that multi-month process over the last year and a half. Um, there were many public meetings, uh, in-person meetings, conversations with the Rec Commission about what community members wanted to see um, at a re-imagined um, Mata Field here in, in Provincetown. And so there's a um, thing in the book, there's a, a couple of images of the conceptual master plan. And in the explanation of the article, there's a little bit more information as to the components of it. Going into a special town meeting, we have just over a million dollars in the capital stabilization fund, uh, 1,066,000. Uh, this article is 250,000, which would bring the CIP balance down to 816,000. Article five is capital funding for transfer station uh, trash trailers. Um, we have a total of six trailers for the transfer station to haul trash and recycling out of town for disposal uh, for trash and tour for recycling uh, in the transfer station. DPW is in immediate need of two new trailers uh, to replace the aged and uh, rotten ones, rusted ones, uh, and not replacing these trailers will affect the operation of the transfer station. Um, this is not a CIP request, and so that the $250,000 for the for the two new trailers is coming from a closed article. Um, town meeting had authorized money for a generator at the public library. We're closing that article and transferring it to pay for this entirely. Uh, the library will benefit from the uh, generator that will be available once we close the current police station. Um, on Shank Painter. And so the library will get that generator. We no longer need the money that the body appropriated for a new generator at the library. And we're using that money now for these two trash trailers. And so there's no, um, it's, it's not a debt exclusion, nor will it come from the current balance of the, of the CIP. A little bit more information on the trash trailers. Article six is Eversource easement for a transformer at the police station on Jerome Smith Road. Um, this is just, again, a procedural legal step that the town needs to take to allow Eversource the easement to install service, an electric pad mount transformer that will serve the new police station um, on Jerome Smith. Um, project, as many of you know and see, is, is moving along um, and we expect it to be complete uh, early next year. Go for it. Do you mean the electric pad mount transformer itself or separate? Um, Yep. Yeah. yeah. Braden um, is our senior project manager that works with the building committee and oversees the construction of the police station. I don't know if you have information yeah. on it now, or we can uh, answer questions after the meeting as well. Yeah, so that um, there will be on a, part, a couple of the sides, we're going to be putting up a cedar fence. And then the rest of the enclosure is going to be hidden behind the mini planting and trees that'll be coming on the site. So you'll start to see the landscaping go in as we finish putting up the cedar wall at the far end of the building. You'll see all the plantings come in probably next week and the generator paddle kind of the transformer paddle kind of disappear behind a cedar fence and landscaping. We have renderings of what, the, what it would look like covered or whatnot. On the town website, on the new police station page, you can see some of the, the landscape renderings uh, on that site. Yeah. 
Article 7 uh, in the same neighborhood on Jerome Smith. Uh, this is capital funding for site readiness and preparation. Uh, so 3 Jerome Smith is a former VFW where the community builders is slated to begin construction on 65 uh, rental affordable apartments. Uh, construction slated to begin spring of 2024. Uh, the town promised a clean site, so the town has already demolished the VFW building, um, yet there still is an underground septic tank uh, from the VFW that the town needs to remove before we close on the property early next year. Um, originally, so in the warrant, you'll see a request for $200,000 from the Capital Stabilization Fund. Um, thankfully, just a few weeks ago, we were awarded a $180,000 grant uh, from the state through the MassWorks program. Uh, so instead of asking uh, voters for 200,000, we've reduced that down to 40,000 uh, to meet both the match requirement and the contingency budget. But this will also come from the Capital Stabilization Fund, um, 816,000 balance uh, minus the 40 brings the CIP balance down to $776,000. And so again, this would fund the septic tank removal at the old VFW to allow the town to close on the property and begin construction on the 65 year round apartments. Article 8, as I mentioned before, was the um, impetus to call a special uh, town meeting a couple of months ago. Um, so 22, 22R is one parcel and 24 Nelson Ave is uh, the other parcel. Uh, under the agreed terms, the town will purchase 22, 22R Nelson Ave for 1.27 million and the property at 24 Nelson Ave for 765,000 uh, for a total of $2,035,000. There's more information on page 18, 19 um, of, the, of the booklet in front of you. Um, these two properties present an increasingly rare opportunity for the town to embark on ambitious community housing projects in the coming years. As some folks know, 22 Nelson Ave had already been approved and permitted for 12 ownership units, 10 of which would have been private market rate um, ownership condos, two of which would have been um, affordable home ownership opportunities through the inclusionary zoning bylaw. Um, the property then was listed uh, for 1.45 million. The town was able to negotiate that down to the 1.27. Um, it became a more attractive opportunity um, after we contacted the owner of 24 Nelson that abuts 22 to provide a larger footprint for future um, housing development. Once the property um, is served by town sewer in the coming year, so right now the property is not on sewer, that end of area of the town is um, not provided service by sewer at this point. And so being on septic limits the development potential of that site. Uh, the sewer a sewer implementation plan is in 6B for that neighborhood, so it will likely happen between 2027 and 2030, which significantly increases the development potential there. Um, but this is an opportunity for the town to land bank um, real estate in town for future housing development. So there's obviously the cost of purchasing the land, and there's obviously the cost of uh, inaction or not purchasing the land. And so again, this has already been permitted and approved uh, by town boards for 12 units. Um, well, we can make a compelling argument as to why the town should purchase this and develop housing at it at a future date. Um, we also know that if the town doesn't purchase this property, it's likely that another developer, a private developer, would purchase it and develop uh, the plan that's already been approved. Any housing developed on either of these parcels, 100% um, of the units would be deed restricted. Uh, they couldn't be short term rented. Uh, it would either be focused on affordable um, or middle income market rate uh, rental housing uh, in the community. Then just a little bit more about the units and by no means is the town agreeing or promising or pledging to develop the maximum number of allowed units once connected to uh, the sewer system. Um, so right now the development potential 24 Nelson currently allows for nine units upon sewer connection development density is expected to expand to 12 to 18 units. And then when these parcels are combined, the town could explore the development of up to 18 units today um, without sewer or between 48 to 60 units of housing once served by uh, the sewer system. Any questions on these? So this on this slide, you'll see a um, just an image of the parcels together. Peter. Peter Epstein. 
Um, Alex, can you um, explain the funding for this? Is it a debt exclusion, um, the total cost? No, so um, thanks for asking. So the funding for this is in the form of short-term borrowing. And so the town would short-term borrow uh, the $2 million with the intention of fully paying it off at the annual town meeting. So at annual town meeting, we have more funding buckets available to the town than we do in October, namely free cash. And so free cash is typically certified at the beginning of the calendar year, which then becomes available to the town or annual town meeting. So the last three town meetings, the town has had at least four to five million dollars of free cash. Free cash is essentially um, unspent money, unspent money from the prior fiscal year. So revenues exceeding um, expectations or expenses coming under um, budgeted expenses creates free cash the following fiscal year. The town then funds its capital improvement plan with a combination of free cash and then money in the capital stabilization account. One of the options presented to the select board was a debt exclusion, a $2 million debt exclusion that would then be put on the taxpayers. Um, but the decision was we feel like we'll have the finances to fully pay this off in April without it being a debt exclusion. Um, right. So we'll come back to the voters in April to fully pay the short term uh, bond off. Again, with the debt exclusion, if we paid this over a 20 or 30 year period, we'd be paying uh, not too much more, but we'd be paying interest over a 20 or 30 year period on a relatively small um, acquisition compared to some of the other debt exclusions and uh, investments that the town has made. At some other point, maybe um, we can have a discussion about free cash and capital stabilization. We don't have to do it now. Um, I was unaware of the fact that the town had that much so-called free cash. That's okay. Well, well nothing's free. Yeah. It's, a, it's a good thing, I guess, right? I, we, we've actually done a better job the last couple of years um, not draining free cash on an annual basis. And so I think in the past, the assumption was you go into town meeting with $4 million, you spend all $4 million. Um, you know, but given economic changes, recessions, COVID, the unpredictability of revenues and expenses. Um, it's important to, so we ended FY23, for example, with a, just over a million dollars in free cash, and that'll roll over and add to the uh, free cash will get certified early next year. And then we can get into this um, at another time, but the capital stabilization fund is funded through uh, rooms tax receipts. Town meeting has been involved in the home rule petition to create the funding buckets from the rooms tax. So there's five categories now. Uh, 30 percent, the biggest percentage now goes into a separate housing fund. There's just over a million dollars now just since January of this year in the new housing fund that can go towards potentially this purchase, uh, can go towards other housing um, efforts. Percentage goes to the general fund, a percentage goes to the capital stabilization, percentage goes to the sewer fund, and then a percentage goes to the tourism fund. And last year in FY23, the town got about five million dollars in rooms tax receipts, um, about five point one the year before, and stepped up. Yes. Uh, I just want to be. Uh, you you haven't made you have made it very clear. This is just to acquire the land. All the discussions about the future development would uh, would go through permitting and discussion at, at a later date. Uh, yeah. I would only say that you're talking about 40 or 50 units in that neighborhood. It sounds excessive to me with, with sewer or without, but uh, at any rate, that's a discussion for a later date. Yeah, so this is just the acquisition uh, by voting or approving this. We're not binding the town to any number of units. Right, got it. And there could potentially even be a possibility to talk about open space. I know there's been conversations about portions of this land at, you know, at least five years ago being discussed for open space with the so. Any other thoughts or questions on, on this one? <clears throat> we have some more information in the booklet just about the opinion of value for the properties, uh, comparing the acquisition of these parcels compared to other uh, sales and acquisitions in town. 
we typically calculate cost per unit, cost per square foot, cost per unit under the current allowed density, cost per unit under the potential density um, to see if it makes financial sense for the town to consider such acquisitions. Article 9 on page 20, <clears throat> page 20. This, um, so Article 9 is declaration of surplus of property located at 26 Shank Painter Road and 15 Brown Street. Uh, so a declaration of surplus property, essentially for the town to sell any property, be it anything from office chairs to uh, unused fire trucks. I know we're, uh, the fire department is trying to sell an older fire truck that's no longer used to town-owned property. Town meeting needs to authorize the select board to go through a disposition process. Uh, and so for the town to move forward on potential development of housing at the current police station, uh, town meeting needs to authorize the declaration of surplus for this property. So again, the, the approval of Article 9 does not bind the town to any particular plan um, developer. It just empowers town staff and the select board to move forward with the request for proposal process um, and the disposition process. Um, the surplus declaration for 3 Jerome Smith, uh, where the 65 apartments um, are happening, happened at the same time that the town purchased that land in 2013. So in the motion, for example, for 22 and 24, Nelson includes the disposition of those already. So we won't have to come back to town meeting to um, declare them surplus. On a, on a separate um, note, the town did go through an RFP process um, for this, accepted a proposal for 40 year round market rate apartments. Uh, and the town uh, is currently working with the developer. They still have to go through all of the town regulatory boards and get financing and things like that. Those, so there's still a number of hurdles before that project is officially uh, moving forward. Uh, but given that the town is focused on deed restricted affordable units at the VFW, we have a, a big segment of the population that makes a little too much to qualify for traditional affordable, doesn't make enough to purchase a home here. And so oftentimes there's this missing middle of people that make um, upwards of 60, over 100,000 that are sort of uneligible un 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 to qualify for affordable, but also can find a year-round rental um, in Provincetown. Harbor Hill puts a little bit of dent in there, but we have a long waiting list for just those middle-income unrestricted rental units in town in general. Article 10 probably looks a little familiar. So in uh, April of 2022, town meeting authorized the purchase of 288A Bradford Street. Uh, as a joint open space um, housing development opportunity uh, for the town. This is the, the same language of Article 9, declaring 288A Bradford Street uh, surplus property, uh, which again would allow the select board in the town to officially dispose of the property um, to pursue housing development at 288A Bradford Street. Uh, the town uh, staff already has an agreement with conservation and open space in terms of uh, the line by which uh, we would preserve the, the back half portion to open space. Um, I think we're working with the planning board to divide uh, the property um, in the coming weeks. Uh, and again, this would just allow the town to go through an official disposition process, release, release an RFP. This doesn't bind the town to any particular type of housing um, or any particular type of, of developer. Is, um, is this the property next to the tennis club? Okay, so on the left of the tennis club, that, that was just developed. On the right, as I understand it, um, there is a tenant in that house. And so um, town is going to go ahead and purchase this. The town already owns it. The town owns that property. Yes, so we bought it in April of 2022. All right, I didn't realize that. And what's the status then? Nothing can be done about that until the tenant yeah. vacates. So we made a commitment to town meeting and to the two tenants at the time we purchased it that we wouldn't move forward on development there until we rehomed the two tenants okay. who had lived there for quite a long time. Um, one of the two tenants has successfully then rehomed in Provincetown. Uh, and we're working with the remaining tenant. Uh, right. So that that property that's no, it's it's not a wetland because in back of the two omni courts at the tennis club, you no, know, those are wetlands. They cannot. I think they're wetlands. They cannot be 
developed. Am I mistaken? And I thought there was an issue with that property as well. Yeah, so if you can, if you look at the slide here, you can see the wetland area where the blue mark is. So that, so the red outlined is 288A Bradford Street that the town owns. Um, okay. And the, the blue section there is um, section by which we can't really develop. Um, and we walked the site with open space. I know we did this a couple of years ago. Okay. There's also a trail there. Um, and so we wanna make sure we maintain trail access okay. to the public. So only a, a chunk of the front end section facing Bradford Street is developable. And we've looked at potentially upwards of 15 units of, of housing at on the on the Bradford Street end of that parcel. Okay. Um, did you ask for any input from the board of directors of the tennis club? You didn't have to, but I don't know if there was input from the board on this. Uh, no. no, I think the like the owners and residents would be more concerned about the tennis club than the other way around. Um, yeah. But the the parcel on the left, if you're facing the tennis club, was privately developed. Yes. It was an inclusionary project. But I think eight of the units were market rate condos. One or two of them was affordable homes. All of the units being developed at 288A by the town would be either affordable or deed restricted. None would be market rate um, condos. Okay. Thank you. When that front third is developed, will there still be access to the rear third for the public? That um, That is something we intend to include in a request for proposals that in any development plan that's presented to the town, we'd like to retain access from Bradford Street to that, to that trail. And so again, even though the town already purchased this, town meeting appropriated the funds in April of 2022, this again just allows the town to go through that RFP process um, and there are several uh, points along that process where the public can engage, be with the planning board, uh, other commissions to give to give feedback, um, and Peter opportunities for development at the site. Abutters would be notified of any um, meetings with regulatory boards regarding development or decisions that would be made um, at a site like this. All right, Article 11. So Article 11 and Article 12 are related to short-term rentals. <clears throat> if you were at town meeting in April, you probably have memories of uh, short-term rental debates and discussions. Um, this article uh, creates a general bylaw to regulate short-term rentals with items that appear to have broad support among our housing boards and housing advocates. Uh, this bylaw, Article 11 in particular, would prohibit corporations from obtaining short-term rental certificates. Uh, so at annual town meeting in April, uh, there were um, a handful of citizen petitions to regulate uh, short-term rentals. Uh, there was one petition to put an overall cap on the number of SDR certificates that the town could distribute. Uh, there was one to create a sort of a private uh, cap and trade like model. Um, and so in April, uh, none of the petitions passed town meeting. We did commit in April that we were engaged with the Dunhu Institute at UMass to do a impact analysis of short-term rentals on Provincetown's economy, tourism, availability of housing, um, affordability of housing, and whether or not any of the citizen petitions or other proposals that have been discussed would actually lead to the increase of year-round housing supply. Uh, the town has since uh, gotten that analysis back. It's available on our website. It's been presented to the select board um, a couple of weeks ago. We have the slides and the entire uh, report available um, to the public. Um, so that was an important piece. And then following the April town meeting, uh, we knew that this was something that the town needed to address one way or another. And so we convened our housing workshop model, which includes the planning board, the community housing council, the market rate year round trust, uh, and the select board um, over several meetings to look at potential short-term rental regulations where we felt like there was some common ground and consensus, which led to article 11 uh, which prohibits corporations from obtaining SDR certificates, and then um, Article 12, uh, we will get to. Um, <clears throat> just a little bit of information um, on Article 11, and then we can open it up for uh, comments and questions. Currently, the town believes there are approximately five, uh, but there could be dozens more corporations who hold valid SDR certificates uh, with the town. This article would grandfather these certificates in, but no new corporations would be allowed to get certificates once this bylaw takes effect. 
Uh, since January of 2023, as we uh, presented in April, the town has been engaged in robust short-term rental identification, compliance, and enforcement efforts to ensure that everyone operating a short-term rental has a valid certificate. Uh, currently, the town has 903 active uh, and valid short-term rental certificates, an increase of 276 uh, from before January 2023, when the new compliance efforts began. A trust LLCs uh, tied to a natural person would still be allowed to get a short-term uh, rental certificate. So what Article 11 does, and what it does not do. Um, it creates a section in our general bylaw defining short-term rentals and establishing regulations. This is similar to a bylaw passed in Great Barrington and, and approved already by the Attorney General. It prohibits short-term rentals and dwelling units owned by a corporation. It protects existing short-term rentals, so any person or other legal entity who holds a current certificate of registration may continue to engage in short-term rentals in accordance with their certificate until the dwelling unit is transferred or conveyed or the certificate of registration is not renewed. It does not place an overall cap on the number of SDR certificates uh, and does not take away anyone's current certificate or ability to get a short-term rental certificate um, in the future. No, you were, I don't know if you have a, a question. I know you were at the mic. Yeah, my question is I have a, I'm zoned four units. I live in one, I do three short-term rentals. If I sell the property, the person buying the property will only be allowed two short-term rental certificates. Is that correct? Uh, yes. So you, so you devalue my property automatically by doing that. Because the person buying it may want to rent three, may not want to rent three. <clears throat> not, not necessarily. So if you... Um, what do you mean not necessarily? You could still, you could still obtain a long-term rental certificate? Well, you know, I did a long-term rental two years ago. Yep. And it cost me six thousand dollars in legal fees because Massachusetts is a renter state, not a landlord. Mm -hmm. Six thousand in legal fees, four thousand in lost rent, two thousand in property damage. Mm -hmm. Police were out to my house twenty times. The man was arrested three times, and we had to move out of our house for two weeks because he was so violent. So no, I'm not looking at long-term rental. Yeah. So I don't understand why you keep taking my property rights away from me. I bought a property that was zoned for four units, and I should be able to continue to do short-term rentals on the other three if I would like. And you can under this bylaw. No, if I sell the property, the new person can't. Yeah, but you, you talked about you, and so I'm talking about you, that you can. We're not taking your rights away. As long as you own the property, you can have as many short-term rentals as you well, already have. if I sell the have. property, you're taking the right, rights away from the person buying it, which devalues my property because I can no longer do. I mean, you know, the way things keep going up in this town, People need that income to be able to live here. Well, part of the intent of these bylaws is to, over time, protect and preserve year-round housing. And so any new owner of that property would be able to get up to two short-term rental certificates. Well, it, should be, that it should be to what the property is zoned to. It shouldn't be what somebody feels like should be right. My property is zoned for four units, and I should be able to do, if I didn't want to live there, four short-term rentals. Okay. That's where you're taking my rights away. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate your opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Article 11 is just corporations. We'll get to Article 12, which, yeah. <clears throat> and I would just clarify that um, it's one person. So if it's a household of one, one legal person, we have different types of households in this community. Um, and so depending on your particular situation, there could be more uh, short-term rentals. Yeah, I'm back to my rights again. You're dictating how I can do my property. I pay okay. 20000 in taxes. I pay 5000 in insurance. Mm -hmm. I pay 4000 in utilities. You know, the person who buys my property is going to hopefully pay more for it than I paid for it, and they're going to need that income to be able to live in town. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, you're all short-sighted. I mean, you want two rentals per person and that's what we do here we're vacation mm -hmm. we you know we've like i said before lot, if, so, like I said before, if, if you have three sdr certificates or 12 sdr certificates as long as you own the property you can have that same and number you just of repeat the same thing. i mean you know i can someone could also get two short-term rental certificates and then get a long-term rental certificate yep no i heard you and i can yeah well i can't that's too, that's too bad Hi, Brian De Laurentiis, and I want. Do I read 
13-8-5-1 correctly that the board will have criminal prosecutorial authority such that the police can come and see who's living in the house, such that the police could subpoena our bank records and see where we're getting our income from? Are we really going to convey to the town the ability to prosecute people for not having a short-term rental? Isn't that what this, am I reading this bylaw correctly? This is for the first time established as a bylaw. So we, our short-term rentals are currently governed completely under Board of Health regulations. Yes, and this if you'd like me to review those differences, they are the following. One, the ability to indict in the district court. Two, civil penalties of $5,000 per day for not having a short-term certificate, whereas the present Board of Health regulation has a maximum of $300 per day, and assuming it can't be more than 30 days, that's 300 times 30, as opposed to 5,000 times 30, which is a $150,000 fine. And also, as I read the Board of Health regulation, um, it's $120 a year versus $750 a year under this new regulation. So the town is taking several hundred dollars more with each of the 900 uh, applications and having the criminal authority to allow the chief of police to decide in his discretion whether or not to come knocking on your door to see who lives there is improper. That's my question and comment. But I, yes or no, there are criminal powers in this law. I'd have to talk to town council, and town council will be available on Monday night. Has town council reviewed this? Yes, they drafted it. Has there replicated been, other communities? Is there an opinion bylaws. supplied to the town, uh, to the select board? Yeah, absolutely, they approve this language. I vote no. That's on Monday. All right. Article 12, which we've briefly touched on as well. This is another general bylaw amendment. Prohibitions related to short-term rental of residential properties, additional regulations. This one starts on page 26 in the booklet. In the event that Article 11 is adopted by town meeting, uh, the prior article, uh, this article amends the general bylaw to regulate short-term rentals by adding uh, a subsection allowing individuals to obtain no more than two short-term rental certificates. Any person or legal entity who holds a current certificate of registration on the effective date of this bylaw may continue to engage in short-term rentals in accordance with the existing certificate of registration until the dwelling unit is transferred or conveyed or the certificate of registration is not renewed. This includes individuals, entities who may have three or more SDR certificates. If a property is bequeathed to a person or other beneficiary through a will, the new owner may continue to engage in SDR activities in accordance with this uh, section. Currently, the town believes there are approximately 21 people who have two or more active short-term rental, rental certificates. It grandfathers those certificates in, uh, but getting more than two SDR certificates would no longer be allowed once this general bylaw takes effect. Uh, this, again, does not impact the amount of long-term rental certificates someone can get to rent year-round or for more than 31 days. And what Article 12 does and what it does not do. If Article 11 passes, Article 12 amends the bylaws to regulate short-term rentals. Um, again, to two rental certificates, currently there is no limit. Uh, it protects existing short-term rentals, does not place an overall cap on the number of certs allowed in town, and does not take away anyone's current SDR certificates or ability to get a short-term rental certificate from the town. These articles pass, when do they take effect? Immediately? No. They, uh, the, all bylaws have to go to the Attorney General's office for um, approval. And so the AG would have to officially approve the language in the bylaw. Uh, sometimes it takes up to 90 days, could take up to six months. Um, and so it typically isn't effective immediately. Hi, uh, David Abel. <clears throat> Just a question. What is the problem that um, this article was created to address? Why was this article created? So the, as I sort of mentioned before, so the UMass Dunning Institute 
analyzed the current impact of short-term rentals and then looked at potential regulations. Um, blanket caps, for example, a cap on the number of short-term rental certificates based on the Institute's analysis <clears throat> would have little impact on the availability or affordability of rentals in town. Article 11 and Article 12 in the town's uh, vantage point are more preventative proactive approaches that the town could take now to prevent the pro proliferation of corporations owning short-term rentals, pursuing short-term rentals. And then number two, um, while we don't have many individuals that have more than one short-term rental certificate, we want to prevent that from happening in the future. We want to encourage people to also rent year-round. One of the things that the report found is short-term rentals are critical to Provincetown's economy. We have a huge second homeowner uh, population here and banning or restricting short-term rentals um, wouldn't necessarily lead to more second homeowners renting to folks year round because people, number one, want to enjoy the home that they purchased. Um, and so the analysis covered all of these different points. The two areas where they said there was some opportunity to get ahead of any future um, challenge was number one, banning corporations, and number two, the town could consider um, putting a limit on the number of short-term rental certificates that one person could have. The second homeowner argument sort of falls apart when a second homeowner has a third home and a fourth home, right? So if, for example, someone is buying multiple properties to get multiple short-term rental certificates, we understand that you're, you may need to short-term rent your primary second home, sort of an oxymoron, but your first second home um, to potentially pay your mortgage or afford to, to, to even live in your second home or spend time there. Uh, but if you're now buying multiple properties beyond your second home, the intention of short-term renting, the town wants to get ahead of uh, sort of that behavior or that. Okay, well, I, mean, I, I totally get that we don't want yeah. corporations owning multiple units to do that, but why is the number two the number that is, is in Article 12? I mean, why yeah. couldn't someone have three or four? If they maybe they live here and they have three or four short-term rental units on their same property, like the gentleman who spoke, why is that a bad thing? Yeah, so... Anybody that has three or four now can have three or four as, yeah, I get as it, long as they'd in like. In the future, why would that be a bad thing in the future? Uh, for example, so if the property does change hands over time, we may be able to convert short-term rentals into long-term rentals. So if there's three units, potentially two of them are short-term rented and one of them is now rented to a tenant long-term. Separately from these articles, one of the recommendations in the analysis was for the town to look at programs like in Truckee, California, where the town is subsidizing a, por a portion of that delta between what people make short-term renting in three months and what they make 12 months renting uh, long-term. So we know we can't uh, regulate or discipline folks into long-term renting, but other incentives or carrots that the town could establish to encourage more people to rent uh, year-round. And so we know that this alone will not address the housing crisis. It's one step. Uh, when we went through the housing workshop, uh, there were some folks that supported it being three or four per person. There were some folks that preferred it being zero or one. Um, and so the compromise in the housing workshop was let's put the language of two forward. Um, so at town meeting, um, the uh, moderator typically when amendments potentially come up on bylaws like this, uh, it's outside the scope if there's an amendment to make it more restrictive. And so for example, if there's an amendment to go from two per person to one, uh, that amendment wouldn't be allowed, it's outside the scope. It could be considered in April um, at town meeting. For example, there was a, an amendment to um, increase that number. It's less restrictive. What I assume, I can't speak for the moderator, it would be within scope and we can debate um, that item. Okay. Um, I mean, I have no agenda here because yeah. I'm just, I mean, you're on resident. I have one property. I don't intend to rent it out. Yeah. But I just wonder about the fairness of Article 12. No, I don't. I don't really understand the rationale. So. Yeah. No. And there's not a right or wrong, and people are entitled to the to their opinions. I'm just sharing their perspective of the housing workshops and the town. Uh, hi, my name is Evan Savely. Uh, I just want to thank you all for having this event, <clears throat> and also your clear explanations of things. Um, I'm looking here that uh, for Warrant 12, the Year-Round Housing Trust does not recommend this, <clears throat> and I'm I'm assuming they'll present their case during the town meeting. Is that correct? Uh, boards have discretion as to whether or not they report on an article. So I don't think any member of the trust has signed up to, to give a report, but okay. that could change. People can decide in the moment if they'd like to speak to it. Yeah. Thank you.
I will say that year on trust was part of all of our housing workshops and um, and so would be curious as to the rationale there. But I know two of the members of the trust uh, voted in favor of recommending both those articles. Um, to the previous previous speaker, you addressed him with his, your answer and you said second homeowners the whole time. You still haven't mentioned people like me who live here year round who are homeowners. I mean, you know, you just, I guess you guys don't understand it. You don't own property. You don't need the income to live here. Do own property here, by the way. Just one, though. Any other questions on Article 12, what it does, what it does not do? And, and as I said, town meeting is a space to debate, share your thoughts, opinions. Um, at the beginning of the booklet, there's uh, explanations as to how to make motions, um, provide feedback, and things like that. And everyone's entitled to share their thoughts or opinions. Like I said, there's right or wrong is very uh, subjective. So we encourage people to debate, do your research, and uh, vote accordingly. I mentioned this before in the introduction to 11 and 12, but again, a significant number of residents voiced support to pass short-term rental regulations. Since then, the town worked with UMass uh, to study the STRI landscape. Um, and again, we looked at those findings and then went through the process with our um, housing workshops uh, to get to where we are today. Article 13 begins on page 30. This zoning bylaw would restrict uh, what's called fractional ownership in Provincetown. Uh, this describes properties owned by multiple parties who each own a percentage along with sharing usage rights. Uh, similar to timeshares, fractional ownership properties operate through the central management agreements and by limiting shareholders' occupancy to a certain time frame. Under the joint management or ownership structure, share owners have full discretion regarding selling, purchasing, renting, or further dividing their interest uh, in the property. Uh, many believe that fractional ownership poses a direct risk to the year-round residents and their access to stable year-round housing. Uh, Tisbury passed a similar bylaw at their annual town meeting earlier this year, and Nantucket and communities on Martha's Vineyard are proposing similar bans. This does not prohibit multiple people from owning a shared residence or from forming a corporation to own a residence. Questions on Article 13? On page 32, you can see an example of a, a Picasso listing of a fractional ownership. This really hasn't become um, prevalent in Provincetown. Uh, this again is one of those measures getting ahead of what we're now seeing on the vineyard and other places. Uh, so we'd like to get ahead of fractional ownership before it becomes a challenge here in town. So, what if a group of friends decide because property tax property values are so high? If a group of friends goes in and says, hey, we're a group of five and we want to buy this together to a board. That's completely 100% still allowed. This. Yeah, so this is separate. This is going through like a the central management system. And, Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any numbers on how many of those we have in town? If any? I don't know if we have any right now. It's here. But again, you can see the example in Nantucket. I think they're advertising one eighth of an ownership of a home there for one point two five million. Article 14, accessory dwelling units on page 33. This is another zoning bylaw amendment. Um, this would amend Article um, 2 regarding accessory dwelling units. Um, so a few things. So since the ADU bylaw was uh, created here in Provincetown, there's only been one ADU actually built since 2017. And so clearly the current bylaw regulations are not um, leading to growth or construction of ADUs here um, in town. So this article, um, number one, removes the year-round deed restriction requirement. And so right now anyone that builds an ADU on the property has to have a recorded deed that there has to be a year-round resident there. Um, this has been an impetus to some development. Um, so this would remove that restriction. It would also prohibit ADUs from being short-term rented. 
would allow um, accessory dwelling units to be accessory to a principal commercial unit, um, and it would prevent converting accessory dwelling units into uh, condominiums. Um, but right now, for example, um, a seasonal worker would not be able to live in an ADU because they're required to be year-round deed restrictions. And so this article is one step we hope to encouraging more property owners to look at um, developing ADUs. Another challenge not addressed in this article is just the cost itself of building an ADU. Um, both the Community Development Partnership and Housing Assistance Corporation now have grant programs uh, where they essentially fund the technical assistance, um, uh, looking at the setbacks, does it comply with local zoning, um, square, square footage, things like that. And then you can apply for grants to go towards design construction. Um, a number of Outer Cape communities are looking at like bulk purchase of like construction materials or modular ADUs to bring the cost down for property owners interested in, in uh, looking at an ADU. Um, and so those conversations are ongoing. Uh, but we think one of the steps necessary, and this was um, supported, I think, by about 98% of the housing boards was to move in this direction. And this is really about just increasing supply in town. Right now we have you know, workers and year-round residents, seasonal workers, all competing for limited supply. Um, and even if um, a portion of the new ADUs are occupied year-round, that's still better than 0% um, of zero ADUs in town today. All right, so go ahead. Explain to me, prohibiting converting accessory dwelling units into condominiums, what exactly does that mean? So you wouldn't be able to condoize it, section it off, and then sell it as a market rate condo. Like in my house, if I had a bedroom I was renting out or something? Yeah, so ADUs are allowed by right in town. Um, and so we want to prevent people from just building a property in their backyard and then selling it as a condo to anyone in the, in the town. All right, so that was articles one through 14. Um, any questions about any of the articles, um, thoughts, feedback? Um, staff is available between now and Monday if there are particular questions about. Uh, we've gotten a lot of folks send emails, phone call, pop in, like I have X number of short-term rental certificates or I live at this property and they want to know how particular bylaws may impact them. We're happy to have those conversations leading up to, leading up to town meeting. Um, and we look forward to the um, discussion on Monday night. I uh, would remind people the meeting starts at 6, get here a little early. There's a check-in process out in the lobby. Um, would also remind people uh, every year we send postcards out to what are called inactive voters. Um, so the state now has automatic voter registration. And so if you filled out addresses at the RMV or other state agencies, uh, sometimes your voter registration is switched to inactive in a different community. So we did send postcards to any voter resident that was made an inactive voter. And so if you're unsure as to your voter registration, you could just confirm on the Secretary of State's website. You're also welcome to call our clerk's office or come in person just to confirm um, your voter registration. Um, either way, you're fine if you have an ID on you on Monday night. For anybody that is listed as inactive, um, they're able to vote and participate, assuming they have an ID um, confirming their residence here in, in Provincetown. Uh, and for those of you that aren't registered voters, you're welcome to come. You're just required to sit um, upstairs and enjoy the show, not necessarily participate. We get questions every year if this is broadcast, if people can watch it live. Um, uh, it's not available. It's available to broadcast after. We want to discourage voters and residents from watching from home and only attending the portion uh, where they think their vote would make the most difference. We want people to be part of town meeting fully, be here in person. Um, and not have voters weaponize the process by coming and going based on articles coming up. So, any other thoughts or questions? We'll, we'll be hanging around for a bit, so if there are uh, specific questions or things that you didn't ask, um, just let us know. But really appreciate everyone coming um, and appreciate those online. <laughs>